Hi everyone, this is part three of God Needs You. So I hope you're enjoying the last two teachings when we've built that foundation that God just can't move in to the earth and willy-nilly. He will someday when he wraps the whole thing up, but up to that time, he's given us the authority, the rule and dominion on earth. Sometimes people still find that hard to believe that like, you know, like, let me give you an example. Like, God can do anything. No, he can't. Yes, he can. No, he can't. God can't lie. Yeah, but, no, but, yeah, but, no, but. <laughs> God can't lie. God can't go against his word. So there's some things that God can't do because God has limited himself by his very word. You getting this? So it's easy. And I think having a having a God is in control and everything that happens and God will make a way. God does make a way, don't get me wrong. God works all things together for the good for those who are called according to his purpose. God's a way of making things great for us who cry out to him and call to him. But remember, we talked last week about Second Chronicles 7, 14, and that prayer is earth's license for heavenly intervention. And we looked at Second Chronicles of my people who are called by my name, my people who are called by my name. It's not politicians, it's not doctors, not, not governments. No, not presidents, prime ministers. It's my people who are called in my name that will heal the land through prayer. It's us. We have a great responsibility to pray and to make sure that we're always praying. Pray without ceasing. But if you've got a theology all wrong, it's easy to say, oh, well, no, that's not for me. See, I'm insignificant. We covered that week one. You know you're not. You're part of the body of Christ. There's no insignificant part, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 12, even the ones you think that are small and insignificant, they're necessary. Everything's necessary. You can't say, I don't need you. The head, Jesus can't say, I don't need you. Jesus is actually saying from heaven today, through me, I need you. Wow. That the God that created the heavens and earth needs you? He needs you to reach the neighbour next door. Jesus died for that person. He needs you to preach the gospel to your son and your daughter and your family members. Jesus can't preach the gospel to me. He's already done it. He's in heaven. He's limited himself now. He's out of earth's affairs. He's working through us, through the apostles and prophets and pastors and teachers, evangelists, and you and I on earth today. We covered that last week, remember? Announcing and pronouncing. Only we can declare things. We are kings. We are priests. The Bible says we are a kingdom of priests. Do you know what a priest does? A priest speaks to God on behalf of the people. Men, you're the priest of your home. You're meant to be. Because a priest not only speaks to God about his family, he speaks to his family about God. It's both ways. The priestly ordination is to speak to God on behalf of the people and to speak to the people on behalf of God. And men, you are a priest of your home. How many men who have been called by God are not taking that authority? Not even having prayer. Prayer is God's license on earth. For a heavenly intervention. And you're wondering why you're not getting results. Prayerlessness. Prayerlessness is like a disease in the body of Christ. People are not praying. And they're wondering why all this stuff is happening all around them. Now we've got a theology. We're building this soul. So prayer, remember, prayer releases God. Part one, you're part of this. God's given us this planet. You can't say, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not significant. How would God use me? God doesn't need me. Yeah, he does. We've covered that. But I'm going to cover today another building block and I'm going to bash uh, wrong thinking 
to get you to another stage in your obedience to God and your realization that God needs you. Now I'm going to say something, I'll say get a pen again, write this down. If you have lived a lifestyle of making excuses for not getting involved in the church, not getting involved in your family, not preaching the gospel, not praying, not taking responsibility, then you've been disobedient to your call because God needs you. And someday all of us will face the judgment seat of Christ. And Jesus will tell you, I needed you in that situation. I needed you to pray in that situation. I needed you to go and visit like Peter and make an announcement in that situation. But you had an excuse. You had an excuse. Excuses are the crutches for the uncommitted. <laughs> Ouch. Was that sore? Mm -hmm. Well, Jesus had a ministry of confrontation, challenge, rebuke. What? We can't rebuke. You know, most pastors and priests today are afraid of rebuking. Afraid of confronting and challenging. But the gospel is challenging. The gospel is powerful. We need to be challenged. How many times years ago I remember somebody saying to me, you know, you're working with all these drug addicts and you're, you're just brainwashing them. You know what? Their brains needed washed. And so did my brains. My brains needed washed. Well, amen. My brains. I'm brainwashed by the blood of the Lamb. The precious blood of Jesus Christ has set me free from the sins of this world. That's the gospel. That's the good news. But many people today, so-called Christians, are excuse after excuse after excuse. I can't do this. I can't do that. This is convenient Christianity to you. God's not called you to convenient Christianity. God has called you to covenant Christianity. It's like a supermarket, a bit of this and a bit pick and choose, a pick and choose mentality has crept into the church. And then maybe you're one of those. Oh, is that so? Do you want some sugar with that? <laughs> Make it a wee bit sweet. But that's the ministry of Christ. Christ came to challenge us. Are you getting this? Excuses are the crutches for the uncommitted. So maybe that should challenge you to say, you know what? I'm not going to have any excuses any longer. Let me show you a scripture verse. Go to Luke, chapter 14. Are you with me? Are you okay? You still love me. You have to love me, even though I'm giving you a hard time. You still have to love me. Now go to the Bible. Luke, chapter 14. This is a, a beautiful parable Jesus calls the parable of the great banquet. Jesus replied, a certain man was preparing for a great banquet and invited many guests. At the time of the banquet, he said to his servant, go and tell all those who have been invited to come. Everything is now ready. But they all began to make excuses. Mm, get your pen, suckle it. They all began to make excuses. The first said, I, I have just bought a field and I must go and see it. Please excuse me. Another said, I've just bought five yoke of oxen and I'm on my way to try them out. Please excuse me. Suckle the suckle. Please excuse me. Please excuse me. Still another, I have just got married so I can't come. So the servant came back and reported this to the master. The owner of the house became so angry and said to the servants, go out quickly into the streets and the alleys of the town and bring in the poor, the crippled and the blind and the lame. So the servant said, what of you ordered to be done? But there's still room. What you've ordered has been done, but there's still room. Then the master told his servants, go out to the roads and the country lanes and make them come in. Compel them to come in so that my house will be full. I'll tell you, not one of those men who were invited will taste of my banquet. Excuses. They all began to make excuses. God needs you. There's no room for excuses. Well, see, I don't go to church any longer. Really? Tell me, what's your excuse? Now, it may be 
a reality in your life. It may be a pain, it may be something's upset you, it may be a situation, it may be you're not settled in a church, you're not settled in a parish, fellowship, whatever you may be. But it's an excuse otherwise. It's still an excuse. Because the Bible says we, we should not stop coming to church like others have done. Hebrews 10 verse 25. Don't absent yourself from the community of believers as others, others have done. God has called us to communion. God has called to keep holy the Sabbath day. Now I'll just sit in the house and watch a bit of TV. That's an excuse. Well see, I really don't want to get involved in church. But I'll come along to church. That's an excuse. Because God needs you. You may have a talent. You may have a creativity that we need you and the church and the community to be able to express that and get empowered to do that and release that. And maybe the charism that God has given you will help reach so many others that I could never reach. That's the diversity of the body of Christ. But you know what? We've got so many lone rangers out there who don't want to get involved, who've created a Christ to suit them, who's created a church to suit them. You see, I'm pick and choose. See, I'm a pick and choose Christian. It's this convenient Christianity instead of covenant Christianity. It's this way of creating a, a faith that suits you, that you can make tons of excuses and not get involved and think, well, God doesn't really need me. I'm happy enough sitting in on a Sunday morning. I really don't want to get involved in that Alpha group. I don't really want to get involved in Life in the Spirit seminars or, or discipleship or training or, or visiting the sick. You know, just leave me alone. That's an excuse. You know why? Because you're uncommitted. And people who are uncommitted will always have excuses and they'll actually try and justify it in their own mind. I think, well, you know, God doesn't need me. Well, we'll just prove that God does. Excuses are the crutches for the uncommitted. That's an RB Pierce. How many times are you gonna say that, Terry? How many times is, is it necessary to confront you? Because I love you. God loves us. God allows storms in our life not to get you back, but to bring you back. God is mad about you, he's not mad at you, but mad about you. So although this is challenging and teaching about excuses and how these guys all excuse themselves, they all had other things to do apart from the kingdom. What has God mandated you to do? God has called us all to be part of the church, to the community of believers, to go and evangelise and reach others for the kingdom. Because there is a heaven and there is a hell and Jesus says, Narrow is the road that leads to eternity. But broad is the road that leads to destruction. So that means many people are going to be on this road to destruction. And they need you and me to preach and tell them the good news. You don't have to be on that road. You can follow Jesus. But you want to make excuses. Maybe that person you're looking over every day, looking over into the garden, walking the dog, maybe they just need you to smile and tell them about Jesus. Do you know most people say today when they're, I'm talking about going to church, if they don't go to church any longer, they say they've never been asked. That's the biggest feedback we get. Would you go to church? Yeah, probably would, but I've never really been asked. Never been asked. When was the last time you... I'm caught talking to me as well. Three fingers coming back here to me. When was the last time you asked somebody to come to church with you? When was the last time you told somebody about Jesus? Told them the good news of the gospel? You were told. You're watching this program because you're a disciple of Christ and you're getting challenged. And you're not liking it. It's uncomfortable. But that's the ministry of Christ. That's the ministry that Jesus came on this planet to bring but we have invented this sensitive, this seeker-friendly environment in church. You make everybody happy. And, you know, don't challenge them. Don't challenge their lifestyle. Don't challenge or confront them. Be sensitive to them. We live in an island. We are living in the most secular country in Europe at the moment who are dispelling the gospel, who are rejecting the kingdom 
who have an attitude in their mind they have created a false kingdom, a false Christ that hates them and is judging them. The church hates them and everybody hates them and they don't want anything to do with it. Because sometimes we have preached the truth without love. But the Bible says speak the truth in love. You have to speak both. And you have to love faith works by love. Galatians 5, 6. Are you making excuses? Go with me. This is a hard one. But you know what? It's one that has to happen. Revelation chapter 3. Are you with me? Okay. <coughs> Revelation chapter 3. Go to the back of the Bible. Revelation comes from the Greek word apocalypse. Which means to lift the veil. God lifts <coughs> the veil to us. This is Revelation 3.19. And this is Jesus speaking to the seven churches. Now Revelation 3.19 says this. To those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. <laughs> what just? You mean? I'm getting discipled. Because God loves me and God's challenged me and confronted me because he loves. Yeah, that's what the scripture says. To those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and I will eat with him and he with me. Behold, I stand at the door knocking. I rebuke you. I discipline you. Why? Because I love you. I'm standing at the door of your heart. You may be attending church, but you've never yet invited me into your life. I'm knocking at the door of your heart. And many times this scripture has been used to, to, to reach people who don't know Jesus, and it can be used. Jesus can be knocking on a lot of people's heart, but the scripture in context is to Christians, it's to the church. I'm standing, I'm standing at the door of the church. Behold, would you let me in? I'm rebuking you, I'm challenging you, get back to your first love. He goes on to say, watch this. He who is an ear to hear what the Spirit is saying, let him hear. Wow. I love you. Open the door to Jesus. To him who overcomes, I will give you the right to sit with me on my throne. Just as I overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. But you know what? I'm outside the door. Have you got excuses? For not answering the door. Some of you may remember some of your, the old paintings in some of the classrooms we had when we were children of the, the good shepherd knocking the door. If you look at the painting, you'll notice there was never a door handle in the outside. Jesus couldn't open the door. And the, the artist was, was showing that the door handles in the inside. See, God doesn't impose he proposes, open the door, I'm standing, I'm knocking, I'm knocking the door of your heart. Would you just invite me in and stop making excuses? Because I will come in and sit with you and then you will be a disciple. God needs you. Why would God be knocking on the Door of your heart. If everything's sorted out anyway, God's, God's got it all sorted. We don't really need to do anything because nothing will happen unless God wants it to happen. And, you know, if God wants it to happen, it will happen. No, it's not happening. A lot of people are still not opening that door. Don't tell me God ain't knocking that door. God's knocking on the door right now as I speak to you. Stop making excuses. And go from convenient Christianity to covenant Christianity. Be a true follower of Christ. That's what he wants from you. And he wants that from me. And we're living in a day that people are just looking for a convenient church. Just, you know, just, let's, let's get this over with. But don't ask me to do anything. 
But they have opinions. A lot of people have opinions. We're living in a country, in a world that so many opinions. Just turn the television on, you'll hear opinion after opinion after opinion. And your formation today has led you to think, God doesn't need me. Yes, he does. And we'll take up part four next week. So stop the excuses. Excuses are the crutches of the uncommitted. God bless you. See you next week.